Uh, he was also my medical advisor. I said you. Uh, and Edmunds, you were Edmunds and Mason yeah, and uh, Donald Wolfe. Uh, yeah, but Mason was co-supervisor for us. Oh, we never admitted that. He always blames you. No, no, no. We, because the, the fact is that we were each other's advisors, really. Well, we, we, were, were, all, together. we were all young. Yeah, we, yeah, were, we were together. Uh, Berto was the normal guy. Patrick was my friend. Uh, but then I wanted somebody who actually uh, appreciated uh, uh, reason. Uh, yeah, which yeah, Patrick is not. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So he was interested in it. And he made some. Uh, when I came back and wrote the paper, you know, with Wesley, I showed it to him. He was always signed it, and he pointed me to a few useful things. Uh, well, he was already a YouTuber. Yeah, but, but he's, he said this operation you invented here is a Mikowski software. <laughs> <laughs> so he pointed me yeah. to the fact yeah, that he's that, a strong yeah. 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 Uh, Anyway, so uh, yeah, so he he pointed me to the idea that that, that was a Mikowski software. Uh, 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 that was a really important thing. And the and the fact that it was configuration space is something that Matt pointed out. He didn't really do this. Oh. So, so I said, bring the name. Yeah, here. yeah, no, the, the names, the, the fact that, you know, so I can actually you invent it. Yeah, you I mean, it, it was, I mean, it's not much to invent. I used the parameters. I find a few. I get that by the space of placements, the space of free placements. That took me, like, years to really block the thing. I mean, it sounds trivial, but it, it took me years to really block the No, it was, it was very a useful. It's a It's a very useful thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so. There's a workspace here. It's quite solid in the yeah. space of placements. Right, that was like the idea. Yeah. But I, I didn't know about it from other places. Yeah. So when, when I came back and I, I told Matt about it, he didn't do uh, you know, like Ranger Mechanics paper uh -huh. or some stuff like that. Yeah, yeah the right? physicists know yeah. It, yeah. roughly. Yeah. But they, didn't, they didn't know about the, the distinction between the topology, like the topology of the configuration space is dominated by the geometry of the space, which well, is right. wacky, because the, that's not the way the math and characters like that. That's right. The they mapping, sort of said there's topology yeah. and there's geometry and you know, they're different. Right. Right. And, and this is a mixing of that. Uh, I mean, all those things are kind of, you didn't say them. They're, kind of they're implied, but yeah, so, I, and I wasn't fully aware of them either. I, I, sure. I was just finding something sure. that, oh, well, this seems like sure. a good idea. I didn't know that you had, you figured out that you needed to do the three places. Yeah, no, no, that was the, that was the, that was the essence of our I, I mean, the, the names for these things came from uh -huh. other people. Right, right, right. Let's yeah. give them a few minutes. It's okay. It's that time. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the uh, next uh, series of our address.
conductive emitter is plenty. If you're never going to get it right because your models are wrong, if the energy emitter is plenty, you better start thinking of that. Um, uh, what we eventually think to be the option basin or actually we need to think of that on the cleavage of the back chain of that Many of us just me. Anyway, he's had many, many papers. I don't want to get in the way of his talk. Uh, the ones were so uh, lucky that we came to speak with them. Well. Um, thank you very much, Dan. Um, uh, after such an introduction, I guess the optimal strategy is to stop. <laughs> uh, but then you would, uh, you would uh, come come up with the idea that I stopped doing anything in 1984. <laughs> uh, which may be true, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to argue against that uh, today. So, uh, okay, so uh, I, uh, the, 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 the message in this slide here is the fact that the word using is capitalized. Uh, so uh, uh, today, of course, uh, every talk has to be about learning. Uh, but I'd rather focus uh, also on using it. Uh, so uh, I'll try to uh, co connect the two. Okay, so first of all, uh, I'd like to make clear that the, the goal that I'm interested in is, is one of uh, building general purpose intelligent robots. That doesn't mean that I'm going to show you how to do it today, uh, but it is, it is the goal. Uh, this is as uh, distinct from the majority of robotics, which focuses on doing a particular task well. Uh, so we want to be able to do many tasks well, uh, and at, at least that being a component of, of this algorithm. And really, there, you know, when there are many aspects to this. One way of thinking about it is, well, consider the task of making tea in anyone's home. Uh, that is, uh, you know, Sounds crazy, right? Like, I mean, you say, my God, how many neural nets do I need? Or how much data? I'm like, you know, all, you know, all of Amazon would be, you know, ground to a halt of, you know, creating a training data for that. Uh, but it's a goal that, you know, most of us can do, and we should be, you know, we can strive to try to do. Uh, you know, another aspect of that is be able to do more than one thing. Like, I mean, who would buy a robot that can do one thing? Uh, well, actually, it's lots of people, right? I mean, like an automatic driving car, if it can do one thing, well, you, you might buy it. But there's certainly lots of situations where we want a robot to do multiple things, and that's the question. Uh, the key question is how do we how do we achieve that? Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll try at least to give you some ideas about that. Now, uh, it used to be that at this point I could start talking about what I do. Uh, due to recent developments in, the, in AI and machine learning, I had to spend 15 minutes trying to explain why I'm not doing reinforcement learning. So, uh, uh, so here I go. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, even after the 15 minutes, people ask me which reinforcement learning algorithm I'm using. Uh, uh, okay, so let's let's categorize things this way. Uh, uh, let's let's think about prior knowledge about the task, okay, so, uh, and by prior knowledge I mean, like, you know, how much do we know, do we have models of the, of, of the, of the objects and uh, the dynamics and so on, uh, versus situations in which we don't, or, you know, in which they're, they're uh, uh, very uncertain. So, uh, you know, classically, if I give you a narrow task, uh, and you know a lot about it in advance, then, you know, this is the domain of classic engineering, right? This is an engineering school, I'm going to be familiar, <laughs> I'm going to be familiar with this idea. And this uh, is something that has generated, you know, uh, amazing things, right? Uh, I, I'm not going to show a fighter plane here or, you know, any of the wonderful achievements of uh, engineering. This is a picture of Atlas doing parkour. Um, I, I don't have the, the, I'm not showing you a video because you've all seen it. Uh, and you know, getting the improvement on the method here is okay. So anyway, but you know, with classic engineering, we can do amazing things. Contrary to what is said in the introduction to every paper you read the last few years, we start out classic engineering doesn't work for robotics. Uh, we have to do something else. 
I think if you does work for a while, as long as you know the path and you have uh, uh, good models. Uh, so if you don't know the path, well, but it's narrowly defined, then you can do some amazing things with reinforcement learning. Right? You can uh, do lots of simulations and acquire a policy, and you've all seen this video as well, uh, on the kind of rock, but I mean, you can you know, get a, uh, a hand to manipulate something complicated and so on. Uh, so, uh, you know, in this, in this setting in which we have a narrow path, you can do great things either way. And, uh, of course, uh, you can, you know, uh, use reinforcement learning or optimization and planning, which is classic engineering, uh, which is fine as well. But, as I said at the beginning, these are for, you know, th this methodology is for narrow tasks, and uh, I don't, I'm not focused on doing the narrow tasks well, I'm focused on trying to get, uh, going the wrong way here. I'm trying to do variations in the tasks. I'm trying to do situations in which the task is, is uh, varies a lot. So, you know, how do we do that? How do we get broad confidence uh, across a range of tasks? And this is the domain of planning. This is what we, you know, I've been trying to do since 1979. Yeah. Actually, it's 1974 that I started trying to do this, but it's been a long time that I've been trying to do this. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit of the kinds of things, very broadly, uh, the kinds of things we've been doing in that direction, and it's trying to move in, in the direction of doing a variety of tasks. So uh, the uh, we call this uh, area of robot task and motion planning, and the idea is that we want to be able to uh, have a high level goal, uh, make P, uh, and turn it into a sequence of actions for the robot. Uh, and there are a bunch of challenges. Uh, you know, it's a continuous action. Uh, it's very high dimensional. It's not the configuration space of the robot that matters. It's the configuration space of the world. Uh, I'd like to say that what characterizes my kind of robotics is that we try to change the world. This is a robot. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, but, the, but, but, you know, one nice thing is that the state and the dynamic are factorable. You can break it up. You can say there's an object, right? I'm, I'm not going to think about the world as being one entity that just uh, changes. Uh, uh, you can break it up into pieces, and that gives you computational leverage on, on, on a large problem. So, um, the, I mean, there's a, uh, there's a well-established uh, subfield of robotics, which is motion planning, and these days that usually means sample-based planners, uh, RRTs, and so on. Uh, and they're very good uh, at finding, uh, you know, uh, uh, motions in high-dimensional spaces, uh, but they don't deal with uh, complicated uh, uh, situations involving grasping and moving objects and so on, uh, and they don't deal with long horizon planning. They're kind of short, they're, they're one motion at a time. On the other hand, there's another subfield uh, in AI uh, where people have looked at uh, high dimensional, uh, you know, uh, high dimensional spaces and long action sequences, and there's these strips like planners. Uh, this, you know, in, in the uh, in your 1960s, there was a project at SRI called uh, Safety, uh, which was the first intelligent robot project. And it was so far ahead of its time that at that point in time, it fragmented into all the little tiny subdisciplines that we know of AI. And for many years, nobody tried to put anything together again. It, it's one of the really sad uh, aspects of the history of the science that that project like basically was so awesome that it scared many generations of people uh, to from, ever, from attempting it. But anyway, there's a tiny community of people who picked out one aspect of the planning of that, of that system, the, the symbolic of the planning part, and have, and have some really great ideas about how to uh, uh, do plan long, long sequence planning. Uh, but they're scared of numbers. Uh, so, uh, so our idea is to try to put them uh, together. I mean, this is recorded and posted. I'm going to be in trouble. We're old, right? Yeah. Uh, Just so, about the Democratic debates. So. Uh, it's not yet. Not yet. 
Yeah, okay, I'll try. Well, give me time. Uh, okay, so what we've been trying to do is trying to combine these kinds of uh, ideas to try to get uh, uh, hybrid planning in complicated spaces. Uh, this little robot is, uh, you know, flashing around, and it was told to take a blue object and put it on the table, and it found a, a long sequence of actions necessary to do that. Um, and the important uh, point about this is uh, you can't solve these kinds of problems by saying, I'm going to do the task planning and then find the, find the plan and then uh, do the motion planning. Uh, that's what Shady tried to do, but in general, that doesn't work. The, the, the geometry impacts what, what you know, the way the order in which you do things. Uh, so you really have to uh, do it kind of uh, together at some level. And it's not the kind of situation that you can just do with. Uh, uh, just forward chaining. I mean, it's not you know, you're not going to do a TPS or something in, in this kind of situation uh, for a variety of reasons. One is, uh, you know, it's continuous actions. The, um, you know, if you just kind of do unbiased sampling of actions, you're unlikely to actually solve any problem ever. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, so, so you need some kind of structure. And there's a number of approaches that, that have been developed. We've developed a few, other people have developed some. They, they tend to, to kind of converge on the idea uh, that, that there's a set of constraints, that uh, achieving a problem it, it requires satisfying a set of constraints, that you can think of these as having the free image of one action uh, and you know, the effects of another, the effects achieve the, the, the end really to the free image and this is a structure. And there's a structural search over the actions which, that you put it together, sort of constructing a, a constraint graph, and then picking the values, the continuous values within that structural search. So uh, that's a kind of uh, approach that uh, a lot of people have uh, developed. And I'll tell you about one in particular uh, in a second. But there's, there's an idea that's super important in, uh, to, to make this possible. Uh, and that's the idea that uh, we have actions. And actions are really uh, uh, feedback loops that are parameterized. So for example, the action loop, uh, I move to some location, uh, I uh, 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 close the fingers, or any kind of simple feedback loop. Uh, and in, you know, in this particular case, I'm talking about pick, uh, and it's, it's an action that has some uh, discrete parameters, like which object, and some continuous parameters, for example, like the pose of uh, the object or configuration of the robot. So when you're trying to actually do a pick, you have to uh, choose all those values uh, in order to actually instantiate it. Um, and this is this is this is important because it's the bridge between the effects and uh, what you have to do. Okay. So if I give you a goal. Uh, I have a set of actions which achieve particular uh, goals uh, and a set of conditions which need to be achieved in order for that action to, to be taken. And I can chain them to try to construct a, a solution. This is what gives us the leverage in solving these problems. If I say my, my action is to apply force to the robot, then there's no leverage uh, over the long, over the long horizon. I just have to kind of try it out. Okay, so. Uh, in order to solve a long horizon problem, a uh, problem involving hundreds of actions, I need some leverage, and the leverage comes from this characterization of the action. Um, so, you know, uh, we write these things symbolically. I know that's a dirty word these days, but uh, you can, here's a way of thinking about it, okay? When you write a function and you give it a name, the name doesn't matter. It's the function that matters, right? So think of these as names of functions. That way you don't have to think the dirty thought of a symbol. Uh, it's just, a, just an arbitrary name that refers to a, a test in the environment. Okay? In fact, that's exactly the way they're implemented when it says this graph, that's a function that we call, and it returns true or false depending on that. So, so it's okay. So it's okay to look at this and not avert your eyes. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, with, so you structure the, the, the preconditions, which is the uh, characterization of the free image of the action uh, in terms of a set of uh, 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 tests that, that we can do. Okay, uh, so uh, our, our student, uh, Kaylin Garrett, has developed a, 
but I think it's a, a way of way for timing uh, these customers from timing problems. So the idea is, is, is very simple. The idea is the following. If I have a hybrid problem and I want to construct a plan, one way of, do, of getting it, uh, constructing such a thing is by sampling. So uh, I have continuous values and can sample the continuous values, and then what I get is a discrete problem. That is, all those tests have to be, have to be uh, uh, not choose the actions uh, given those samples that um, connects from the goal to the current state, uh, and that's a discrete search problem. And these uh, uh, scripts planners that the AI companies develop are very efficient search procedures. That, for example, you don't have to specify a, a heuristic for. You know, if you're going to do search, usually you need a heuristic for guidance. They figure out how to get the heuristics automatically. They're in, in the domain of the way. So they're awesome discrete solvers. But since they're scared of numbers, we have to kind of tell them this number here is a symbol. Uh, and, you know, you can find a set of them, you feed them into the planner, and the planner says, yeah, here's a plan or no. Uh, so what we're doing here is basically, uh, you know, constructing a sequence of discrete problems uh, by sampling. And we have, to, and we have these, uh, these uh, uh, functions called screens, which are basically solving uh, for uh, the, the, the sampling in the right uh, that, uh, for example, for a graph for the kinematic, I'll show you in a second what they are. And what we basically generate samples until the, the uh, plan can be constructed. And there are much cleverer ways of guiding the sampling. For example, you, you provide an optimistic sample that satisfies any constraint. Uh, and if you get a plan that has that optimistic sample in it, you say, oh, I better get you know, another sample of these. Uh, and so you can guide the, the sampling as well as uh, it's, you don't do the sampling uh, blindly. So it's a, it's a nice uh, method. It's, uh, you know, it's easy to, to extend to a variety of domains and so on. Uh, and the key here, in addition to the domain, the, the action representation is uh, defining these samplers. So for example, uh, one sampler that we need is inverse kinematics. If I say, uh, I have this object that this pose, and I want this graph. Uh, what's a, uh, what's a, a solution for the configuration of a robot that can reach that location? Okay. So usually, one sample is not enough. Uh, you need to chain them. And one, thing, one way of thinking about this is that it's a multimodal motion planning problem. That is, um, you know, there's, there are modes like where the object is or where the robot is. You need to sample the intersection of these modes. There are, low dimensional constraints in the space that you have to be able to sample. If you just do random sampling in the combined configuration space of the robot and the, uh, and the objects, no, but there's no, but, you know, zero probability that you will pick one in which the robot is grasping the object. So you need to be able to sample that low dimensional space. And you can uh, build uh, from a small set of samplers, you can easily chain them in such a way that you can construct uh, samples in the appropriate spaces, and the the, the part of uh, constructing a, a a solution for a problem is having that uh, set of samplers. And, and the, what the planner does is it uh, part of the solution is to construct a sequence of samplers uh, that will generate the appropriate sample. Anyway, uh, uh, that's just to give you the idea, and the uh, you know the, the result is a system that's. Uh, uh, you know, extends the new domains, uh, assuming that uh, we have this characterization of the actions, uh, then, uh, you know, it, you have to provide samplers. Uh, the way that you actually program this is you have a PDDL file, which looks like the standard PDDL file you've ever seen, uh, AI planners, and then it, it has a, a, a file of samplers uh, that, that you provide, and the system puts them together to solve the problems. Um, and it, you know, it uses these AI planners uh, as a way of uh, basically a search subroutine. You can use Red for search if you like your code to run more slowly, but you know, aside from that, it's, you know, it's, uh, uh, it can do some pretty nice things. Uh, so here's a, a simple example of the robot using uh, this planner. It's using perception to locate the objects, uh, standard 
in a type perception system. And it's given a goal, like, you know, put a green object on the stove. Uh, uh, we're too poor to afford real stoves, so uh, we, you know, uh, all, the, all the money is going to the reinforcement learning people. So, uh, uh, so, so we have to make up these kind of, you know, fake stoves. But the, the, the important thing is that the robot uh, can do these long sequences of actions, uh, you know, uh, pretty reasonably. Uh, and, you know, uh, execute them and so on. And I won't bore you with this, this whole thing. Now, uh, here's the same thing. Sam Planner, uh, uh, Kalen went to visit the Dieter Fox's lab at NVIDIA, and this was his, what he did for the summer, actually part of what he did for the summer. Uh, this is the same planner uh, in a somewhat more challenging situation. Uh, you know, it was given a, an action through, through uh, constraint motion planning to, you know, for, to operate mechanisms. And the goal here was to put a can of spam into the cupboard. The can of spam is in the drawer, so it has to go uh, pick it up. But now uh, it has to change the grasp because it doesn't fit into the cupboard uh, if you grasp it from the top. So uh, it does that. And it does that as part of the planning process of a big set of samplers that I told you about. So that's a, a somewhat more challenging situation, but it's the same code. Okay. Uh, now, uh, one of the, the standard problems, of course, you, know, you can do all this planning and, and execution in a tightly constrained situation, but what happens with uncertainty? Uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, if you actually try to run a real robot, you know that you don't know exactly where everything is, and you don't know what the, the, the uh, you know, you can't control the robot exactly. So one of the things that we've been doing is uh, uh, we've developed a, a way of thinking about this as belief space planning. So the idea is you have an estimation a module that uh, gives you some characterization of the probability distribution of the space of the world of observations. So that's a belief. And then we do planning uh, in that space of beliefs. So uh, you know, the idea is you, you say, I want to believe with high probability that the spam can is in the, uh, is in the drawer. Uh, and uh, we have a characterization uh, of the dynamics in belief space. For example, a, uh, a doing a, a moving an object increases So you plan a sequence of actions that, uh, with high probability, achieves the result. Uh, so uh, here is uh, Kalen's planner operating in that uh, uh, situation. It's, uh, it's been told to uh, pick up the spam can, and the highest probability location was that drawer. It opened it up. It saw, oh, not there, three plans. Looks at the other drawer, sees it, ah! Spam. I should tell you my experience with spam at some other point, but it's sad. Uh, anyway, so uh, the uh, you know it puts it away. Uh, then it uh, you know it knew that it had to close the top drawer in order to open the uh, bottom drawer and put the spam can in. Okay, so this was all planned and replanned based in, in uh, as a sequence of actions in uh, uh, operating in belief space where the observation action and the manipulation action is all fit within one framework. And you construct a plan that involves both like look and move. Okay. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, Leslie Cabling and I, who work, who've been working together for many years, uh, we developed another system uh, uh, base that does this kind of uh, planning. Um, this is, uh, this is code that Leslie and I wrote by ourselves, no students involved. So, uh, and this was done after 1984. <laughs> okay. And you know, there are papers, you know, he's papers, so I did not fall asleep in 1984. That's fine. Um, and the interesting thing about this is not that it's doing any fancy things, it's just that it's doing many different things with the same code. Uh, this is, this is uh, we like to think of this as escape the room. Uh, the robot was told to leave the room, found some chairs in the way, 
figures out that I need to move them out of the way and so on. Here it's doing belief space planning to try to find the full bottle and it's weighing it to try to find it and, and, and so on. So this idea of belief space is uh, a nice unifying way of thinking about uh, planning under uncertainty. And it's basically solving a Pongi key. Uh, if you type uh, uh, Pongi key into Google, it completes out Pongi keys are intractable. <laughs> Uh, which I translate, you know, when I do Google translate on that, it says Pongi keys are interesting. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is solving a Pongi key approximately by the replanning strategy, uh, which is a way of, uh, oh, and uh, we went to Singapore for the summer uh, for a couple of weeks and ported the HPN drug from the PR2 to a uh, uh, fetch. Uh, just to show that it would work, you know, you know, most of you just have to change the URDF, and then I found out that the base was not polynomial, and I had to add the missing planner at the last second, but anyway. Okay, so um, the important thing here is that the only learning was something that Leslie and I did. Uh, the robot wasn't doing any learning. Okay, so, I, 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 you know, uh, the suspense now is, ah, what goes into the fourth quadrant, right? Yeah, well, we know what it is. Uh, we want to get the best of both worlds. We want to get uh, something in which we, uh, uh, you know, have a lot of path variation, and we don't know ahead of time what all of the uh, all of the, the models were. In the previous planning stuff, uh, we had built all the models. Uh, it's not that hard. It's a lot easier than learning, <laughs> but. I know that that's not a lot to, uh, to say, but anyway. So uh, what we need to do is uh, figure out uh, how to incorporate learning into this framework. And uh, I'd like to tell you a couple of ideas that uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, have been followed by our students. But now I have to tell you why not reinforcement learning, right? Uh, the, the, uh, there are two ways to get to this, to this uh, upper corner. You can go along the bottom and go up, or you can go along the top and go across. Uh, those are the, the two paths. So I'd like to tell you why we don't follow the top path and why we're trying to follow the bottom path. I should have flipped this so that I could say we were taking the high road. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, it, was, it was just a strategic uh, mistake, but anyway. Uh, so we're gonna take a low road. But okay, so, uh, so why not the high road? Okay, so there are two settings in which you can think of reinforcement learning. Enforcement learning in the wild, in, in your house, and you tell it, make tea, right? And what happens? You don't have a house. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's forget about that. Let's, so let's focus on the reinforcement learning in the factory, right? Like, you know, we're going to build a factory and we're going to make tea and we send it to your house. Okay, so what are the issues there? Okay, you do random exploration to construct a policy, or maybe slightly guided exploration or Curiosity, or I'm not offending anyone who also was here for curious. Anyway, to, you know, to do it. But basically, you're exploring a ridiculously large space. Like, ridiculously large, right? Uh, so you say, okay, well, what leverage do I have? And say, well, the only input is a reward, so I'm going to hack the reward you got to give me a way of giving me some, some direction. We'll look at some of that in, 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 in the middle. <coughs> And you know you need an efficient simulator, and then you have to make sure that it generalizes because if you want it to work not just in your house but in everyone's house, you have to really kind of sample that even bigger space. So that's a real problem. So this doing reinforcement learning in the factory is basically planning in advance. I mean, what reinforcement learning is doing is solving all the problems and remembering them. There's only the answer, right? Uh, you're, you're hoping that dynamic programming will work for you, approximate dynamic programming via the uh, neural net, but basically you're, you want to construct a policy, so you're solving all of the problems, uh, you know, all possible contingencies, usually for a single objective. So if, if I want to say, you know, I want to do a whole complicated set of things, uh, you know, what, what is the reward? Uh, good luck. Okay. But then at this point, people say, but the crucial, important thing is that I don't need to know anything. Right? Okay, well, let's explore that. 
Okay, so um, here's two approaches. There's reinforcement learning and there's planning. So far, on the left, we have a box which is domain independent, it's a reinforcement learning algorithm. And on the right, we have a planner which is domain independent. Okay? And the difference is that one is trying to learn a policy and the other is trying to learn a plan uh, for a particular situation. Okay? So, uh, so the one on the left, we give a reward, and the one on the right, we give a goal. Let's just look at that. Okay? So, uh, this is a reward from a published reinforcement learning algorithm that's trying to do uh, stacking to, to the next. Uh, we deduce that this person doesn't really know how to program Python very well, but that's better. <laughs> uh, here is Leslie spent a few hours to try to rationalize what this thing is doing. And it's a state machine that it's got its own memory and so on. And uh, it's, you know, those are the, the, the states characterized on the left. And on the right is, uh, is a reward with something like 12 different constants. You know, 0 0.001, 0 0.002, 0 0.003, 0 0.001. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can kind of rationalize it a little bit and say that, you know, in this situation, you want to move towards the object and the object has a known location and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so what you've done is, okay, I've got this exploration problem, which is huge, I mean, like, truly huge. Uh, so I'm going to give you a gradient to follow, okay? And so the idea that, okay, the R of the box doesn't know about the problem, that's true, but the reward certainly does, and it encodes a lot of information. Now, uh, this is what we put in, okay? and it's got symbols, but so did the other one, right? Uh, so uh, this is the goal that we, that we put in. And the question is, why can we get away with doing this? And it's back to this issue that I mentioned before. By characterizing explicitly what the effects are and what the preconditions are, we can use this goal to back chain to a sequence of actions. Okay? So that's. It's, it really boils down to that, that we actually have a structure on the actions and effects that we can exploit to, to, do, uh, to, to solve the problem. So let's go back to this, this, this picture again. Okay, so one of the things that we need, if we're going to build planners, we need a URDF. That's a uh, description of the environment, the robot, the object, and so on. So you say, okay, well, that's knowledge of the past. But if you're going to do uh, simulation, you, do, you need exactly the same URDF. In fact, we've been recently using the kind of dropping down the URDF from the, from, the, from the RL specification and putting it into our plan. So, okay, hide. Uh, and over here, there's the physics. Now, if, you, if you're happy with the Mujoko physics, you don't have to specify them yourself. You buy them from the Joko. But if you wanted to add something, you know, magnetism, uh, good luck, right? You have to put in, you have to try to do it yourself. So for us, what we have to put in is these operators that I showed you, and importantly, this controller. So for us, there is, you know, you get you don't get something for nothing, right? So we structured the problem in such a way that we characterize the actions and in terms of the uh, preconditions and effects, and we can exploit that to solve long, a long horizon problem. Okay, so so that's that is the place where where we differ in in, in a fundamental way, but uh, uh, we can talk about how to learn that in a minute. Now the other difference is that on the left we have a policy, and on the right we have a plan. So that's the old slide. Well, the policy is much more general. First of all, it, it, it feels like a policy is too much to ask for. Solve every problem. I mean, uh, to me, that doesn't feel reasonable for any substantial problem. For some small problems, if you say, learn to ride a bicycle, darn, that's a policy. You know, go for it. Uh, if you say, learn to make tea, that, sorry, that's not a policy. Uh, not at the low level, anyway. And what we do is we, we get a policy by replanning. OK? 
Okay, this is why I showed you earlier. Right, so we construct the, it's empty feet, right? So you construct a plan, uh, you, you know, you, you track that it's making progress as, as you expect, and if it starts not making progress, you replan. So that's, that's what we do. Okay, so, I mean, what, what is it that we really want? You know, well, uh, you know, we, we want, you know, uh, all the nice things, we want it to be efficient, we want it to, uh, be able to, so if we know something advanced, we want to be able to build it in. We want it to be able to give it advice. Learns from a small amount of experience. Learns using relatively small amounts of computation. And most importantly, that it's cumulative and compositional. This is the only way it's going to scale to this problem. So that's what we want, and how do we get it? See, I spent much longer than, 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 uh, than I expected. But anyway, let me just tell you. So what we're doing is roughly building in some stuff, and what we're building in is some algorithms and some initial knowledge. So the algorithms that we build in is basically there's a perception module, there's a, a thing that, which has models, models of the, the environment, you know, objects that you're looking for and that kind of stuff. Uh, it has a planner, which is a domain uh, independent planner with uh, some information like I described before, some models of the world. Uh, some samplers, uh, and then we have some controls, which are these basic primitive actions, and there's this acting module, uh, which uh, kind of orchestrates uh, everything to go together, and uh, there's, there are things you can put in there as well. So, uh, as I said, uh, we have these sensory motor controllers, we have a perception module. The acting module, what we, uh, what we are uh, working on to put in there is actually high level policy. So if you do something many times, if you do, if you make tea in your home a lot, you don't want to plan from scratch every time. So you can learn a policy there. Although we actually think of the policy not at the level of what ports to, to generate, but actually sub goals to, to, to provide. And the actual actions that you, that you do are uh, mediated by the planner. Because the geometry is likely to be different every time. So any kind of low-level representation of the policy is not generalized at all. So uh, you want a policy that's actually uh, uh, represents a set of uh, sub-goals. Uh, uh, so that's the, the kind of direction that we're moving there. And uh, then the planner. So uh, let me see. OK, so let's focus on what I kind of said I was going to talk about uh, initially. So the question is, how do we acquire a new ability? Uh, so this is you know, a classic uh, learning problem. Uh, so most of the work on acquiring new ability or skill uh, focuses on the particular sensory motor controller to do a particular task, to think about porting, cutting, uh, batting, or whatever. Uh, this, this is a, a, a skill, it's a, it's a, it's a feedback loop. Uh, with some parameters. Uh, and we're going to assume we have that. Okay? Um, somebody learned that. That's okay. The question then is, if, I, if you give me one of those, what do I do besides a demo for my thesis? Right? Uh, you know, uh, that is, I want to put it together with something else. So if I want to, uh, uh, here's, here's the, the motivating example. Here's the PR2 making coffee. Okay, so you go over there, you, you pour, uh, then you uh, uh, scoop the sugar, and you put it into the bowl, uh, and then you stir. Okay? So that has a distinct set of skills that were used. Right? There was a pouring, a scooping, a stirring, a picking up kinds of things. And they were orchestrated by the planner to achieve uh, that in this particular situation. <laughs> So how do we do that? Okay, so let's focus on pouring. All right, so imagine that uh, we are given a characterization of the action of pouring, and it has some result, and it's uh, that the destination container has, uh, has a liquid in it, uh, and that is a test that you can actually apply to the world to, 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 to determine whether it's true, and there's this pour operation, which say has a gain parameter, uh, in general, we have more, but let's just uh, look at that right there. And then it has a set of preconditions. 
Some of these preconditions are, again, tests on the world, the world of features or whatever you like, uh, you know, uh, classifiers on the state that tell me whether some things are true. Uh, so that's what, that the liquid is contained in the source or holding and so on. So those are the basic set of things. These are very easy for humans to write. We, we're actually working on trying to learn them. They're also easy to write those things. But there's one other thing that's a bit harder to do, which is this test here. There's a constraint on the parameters that is basically characterizing the continuous aspect of the pre-image of this operation. So there's some tests, like you know, the position has to be so that this is over that, then you know the angles and so on. So that's uh, something that we need to get at. Okay, so the way we do that is to try to, what we've done is try to focus on learning that constraint. So we have the structure of the action for now. We're also working on trying to learn that, but uh, for now, we have the structure of the action. We have some constraint, and we arbitrarily say it's important that it be greater than zero. Uh, so what we do is we basically uh, do regression. Okay, so we have the, the, the space of the parameters, uh, and we have the score, and we have a bunch of examples which we have self-supervised. Uh, uh, the, uh, the robot goes and pours, and we put it on a measuring thing, and it you know, says, uh, measure how much falls in, and so on. Uh, and um, we're using a, a Gaussian process regression. What we're interested in is not actually finding the peak of this. That's not, not good. What we're actually interested in is in the super level set. That is, we're interested in what part of the input space uh, has the uh, values greater than zero. Why do we want to characterize all the mass right, rather than some peak value? Because when you're planning in real life, you don't get to pick all the situations in the world. In general, you're going to have to sample a bunch of values and see which one works out in this particular so we need to characterize the super level set. This is another, this is a learning problem that we have to do. And the, the fact is that, you know, uh, learning is expensive, right? He, uh, uh, many, the graduate students among you will recognize the, what the graduate, our graduate students were going through at this point in time, cleaning up all the crap, excuse me, all the stuff, <laughs> putting it back in the bowl and so on. And, you know, here it is, whoa, you know. Now, we are actually using planning during the acquisition. So we're using motion planning and it knows how to graph and so on. So it's not doing wee, you know, kind of exploration. It's actually very guided, but it's still you know, a mess to do. So it's expensive, so we want to minimize how much of this stuff we have to do. So we're using active learning. We're using the Gaussian process uh, uh, as a way of uh, uh, maximizing you know, information we get from each of the trials. Uh, we use a thing called the straddle algorithm to try to uh, uh, characterize the, 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 the super level set to find uh, the, uh, which actions uh, to, to do so as to, uh, it's the, the dark black line is the super level set. It's the area where, um, where we know that, the, that the, the graph of the function is above zero. Uh, so that's you know the acquisition function for the, 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 the struggle meters uh, that, that tends to guide you to places that will give you uh, more information to uh, to build up a super level set. So uh, if you do this, uh, you get more efficient uh, 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 sampling of the of the uh, you know of the of the test. This was done in simulation for pouring. Uh, this is, you know, what you see here is randomly chosen actions. Clearly, it doesn't work very well. This is a, using a neural network classifier. This is something that Leslie and I did, uh, and uh, it, the primary effect was to enrage our students about how stupid we were. So uh, it turns out that if you use a neural network classifier and try to maximize the output, it's a beautiful way of generating adversarial examples. <laughs> it pushes you into parts of the state that you know nothing about. So it's terrible. Uh, so but, uh, we got a make our picture out of it, so there. Uh, uh, the, you know, uh, but you know, our, our students being much smarter, uh, uh, you know, uh, did this, uh, the GP active learning thing, and it does, it does much better. 
Um, and uh, this, is, this is data from the real robot. Uh, uh, poor Caitlin and Lee uh, uh, spent many hours collecting uh, Garbanzo beans uh, from the table off at the front of the quarry. But you get the same effect doing, the, doing this on the, on the real robot. Um, now, as I said before, uh, the, uh, it's not enough just to do the, the, like the best case. You have to kind of uh, sample uh, a diverse set of values. And uh, we've actually tried to do, uh, to, to uh, actually guide the process to try to find samples that are as diverse as possible. Uh, this is using the idea of this determinantal point processes uh, to try to get the uh, that's a, a kind of secondary point. So the result is that uh, we can learn the preemptives of these uh, of these actions uh, and uh, then combine them uh, with other actions. For example, this robot started out knowing how to do in place of uh, uh, simple objects, and then we learned uh, the, uh, a couple of other actions, the like point and so on, and we can combine them because it, one of the things that the, the, the robot can do is, for example, if the path to, to the core is blocked, you can move things out of the way. It knows how to do that. You don't have to train it. Or here's a situation in which there's something in the way. Here's a situation in which it's, it's not. And, and it's, you know, and it's not like pushing to the left and pushing to the right is different. It's, it's, it's all the same. So, uh, so this, this robot actually uh, can combine the different skills. So this is the, this is the, key, the key point that uh, we wanted to achieve uh, is, to, is to not just be able to do the, you know, that skill once uh, in one particular situation, but to get uh, to, to uh, do it in a uh, combinatorial way. Okay, um, there's other things that you could learn. So what I showed you uh, up to now has been uh, learning uh, in the context of uh, what the primitive actions are and what the preconditions of the primitive actions are. But you can do other things. So one of the things, uh, one of these other things that we've been focusing on is search control knowledge. So one of the, you know these planners can do uh, you know, can do uh, pretty well, but fundamentally planning is a piece that is hard problem. Uh, you know, so it's it's difficult. Uh, so if you're doing the same thing over and over again, if you're you know always making tea in your house, then doing the planning. Uh, you know, from scratch each time, it's not, not great. So you can, you know, how, do, how can you learn from your experience? And what, you know, we've actually tried a variety of different aspects of this, but I can give you a quick look at one. So one is, uh, one of the things that you could imagine learning is a kind of policy for selecting which actions to consider in a particular setting. So uh, for in this kind of situation in which we show uh, a state and there's a set of actions that are available and uh, the, think about the actions as having a discrete component which are just the joint operator on and the continuous component which is uh, you know the, where the robot stands or the grasp or whatever. Uh, so you can think of the search that the robot is doing as kind of going through that tree uh, and uh, so what we're uh, you know, there's in general a, a huge branching factor because we have the discrete layer and then the continuous layer. Um, and the node expansions are expansive. So you have to do motion planning or inverse kinematics. It's not like uh, an PPS in a, in a building board in which you know, each action is very simple. Uh, so uh, the kind of problem that we've been looking at is, for example, uh, you know, how do I know which object to try to move uh, uh, if I if I have the goal of uh, uh, you know uh, moving a bunch of objects from one place to another, and what we would like to do is we would like to generalize between situations in which we're moving a bunch of big objects from the floor, or a situation in which we're trying to move things inside a cupboard. You know, can you learn something about uh, uh, about the uh, about the structure of those problems that you can use for grasping? And the way we do it is. You know, uh, learning a few value. It's uh, it basically you can think of this as kind of an alpha zero type strategy. Uh, so uh, what we have is the agenda that the that the that the planner is using isn't just isn't a, an action agenda only. It's a state action agenda. So that you don't have to do all the expansions when you get to a particular state. You don't have to expand all the actions. So we have to. 
choose some subset of the action. And what we do is we learn a uh, Q value on the discrete component of the actions, like which objects to operate on. Uh, and these actually generalize pretty well. And the way we do that is uh, using a graph neural network because what we want is something, uh, the kind of environments where we operate are very varied, right? So there's the number of objects changes enormously and so on. So uh, what we try to do is to try to find a representation of the state that allows us to learn a finite uh, layer, a finite set of weights and apply it to uh, arbitrarily complicated situations. So for example, we have uh, a representation for objects, like, uh, which is, involves a set of these features, these, these uh, predicates, uh, and then a, a, a representation for relationships among the objects that actually uh, are expensive to compute, but they capture geometric properties such as whether uh, the object is reachable, whether it's in the way. If I want to manipulate this object, is this object in the way? So we have a geometric method that can compute that, and we encode that uh, uh, in the, uh, 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 as a representation of the state. Then the graph neural network learns a fixed set of weights to uh, map the node and arcs uh, you know, into a, an embedding, and then map the neighbors, and uh, the, aggregate the, 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 uh, the nodes with the, the predictive output, and uh, we do message passing inside the graph network and uh, learn the set of weights so that we can compute basically a kind of heuristic uh, on the state, on the actions, uh, to decide which ones to, uh, to do. And uh, let's see, uh, we do max margin training, uh, and uh, it works better than everything else. I, I can tell you more, I'd point you to a paper. It appeared in Coral, in this, uh, this past Coral, so you can uh, see it there. But basically, we, uh, we benchmarked against uh, uh, trying to uh, use a simple heuristic that didn't do the propagation uh, in the network and uh, generally uh, outperforms the others. But the point here, uh, less than the details of the algorithm, is that uh, within a planning framework, so the kind of framework that I showed you, which, which has perception, state estimation, planning, and controller, there's lots of ways of incorporating planning and learning. Uh, to, you, know, the, you can learn models of the world. Uh, you can learn uh, your position and operation models. And you can also learn uh, uh, models uh, that help the operation of the planner itself uh, to try to get uh, better performance. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, my colleague Leslie Kebling, uh, we uh, do all of this together. Z and Kalen uh, did the first part on uh, acquiring uh, the uh, learning tree images, and Wang Jun and Luke did the uh, part on uh, learning uh, uh, how to speed up uh, the plan. And with that, thank you for your attention. Probably time for two questions. Maybe three questions, depending on questions to the speaker. Who, who gets to ask which reinforcement learning algorithm did you use? <laughs> oh, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, in your world, do you usually have to solve like all these problems in the home for cooking and cleaning? Do you imagine that you're going to have all these skills uh, that you either learn or predefine somehow? Do you have a guess at how many different skills you would need to be that's an excellent question. A <laughs> <laughs> um, hundred. <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, let's see. Uh, I believe that there's a finite number of useful uh, options that you typically use, uh, and that you can learn new ones. Uh, but the the important thing 